So you know we are going to speak about this uh, theological political fragment. This fragment has been widely commented and yet we need still to cope with the decisive problem that is there exposed. Is that okay? You hear me? No. <laughs> I don't trust this apparatus. <laughs> 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 Is it better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the problem, huh? the problem which is at the core of the fragment, concerns the relationship between the profane order and the kingdom, history and messianic time. And this Benjamin defines as one of the essential doctrinal pieces of the philosophy of history. So it states clear what is the problem of the fragment, eh? the relationship between the profane order and the kingdom. This is the problem we are which we are trying to understand and comment. First, some uh, observation. As you know, the dating of the fragment is not sure. According to Adorno, Benjamin presented it in San Remo in 1937 or 38 as <coughs> Neustes vom Neuen while Scholem firmly dates back to 1920-1921, a period in which Benjamin, he writes, Scholem, was drawing near to Judaism, suggesting, Scholem, in this way, that the text must be read in a Jewish context. context. While we will see that the notion of uh, Reich Gottes is no less Christian than Jewish. I will not take a position as far as the dating is concerned, although we will see that one of the central theses of the fragment could possibly refer to Benjamin's reading of an essay by Henri Corbin on the Théologie dialectique et histoire that Benjamin could have read in 1934. The fragment begins with the pregnant affirmation of the absolute heterogeneity of the two orders. I quote, nothing historical can relate itself on its own account to anything messianic. Therefore, the kingdom of God is not the telos of the historic historical dynamic. It cannot be set as a goal See, from the standpoint of history, it is not the goal but the end. It is nicht Ziel, sondern Ende. Term. Therefore, the order of the profane cannot be built on the idea of the divine kingdom. <coughs> and therefore, theocracy has no political but only a religious meaning. At that point, Benjamin mentions Ernst Bloch's Geist der Utopie, I quote again, to have repudiated with utmost vehemence <coughs> the political significance of theocracy is the cardinal merit of Bloch's spirit of utopia. <coughs> and th th this quotation is not uh, evident because the opposition between the, there is a, a strong opposition between Benjamin conception and the block conception of the kingdom. Uh, in the Geist der Utopie, the messianic is always conceived as goal, as a seal eh, as the, uh, of historical action. I, um, I quote Bloch, our will is always tends to the kingdom as a goal. So quite the contrary of what Benjamin says. We move towards the kingdom in order to give to everything our color, to hasten and decide everything. So according to Bloch, uh, the, uh, there is a, a deep relation, a tight relation between the history and the messianic. So uh, one thing that uh, we have to 
firmly <coughs> keep clear eh, that we must not uh, forget this essential discrepancy, according to Benjamin, of the two orders. <coughs> eh? Only if we never forget this uh, heterogeneity, we can uh, understand the problem. Uh, let's first <coughs> me make, uh, let's me first make some uh, considerations on the concept of the kingdom of God and the messianic kingdom that appear in the fragment. As you know, this concept belongs both to Jewish and Christian tradition. The idea that the coming of the Messiah would coincide with the eschatological instauration of a divine kingdom on earth is familiar to Jewish tradition. Thus, uh, as uh, Julio has already showed, in the treaty Sanhedrin, we read that the world will last 6,000 years, 2,000 in the chaos, 2,000 under the law, and 2,000 during messianic time. A similar idea appears in the Apocalypse and the early Christian text, especially in Justinus and their dairy fathers, and Justinus and Irenaeus, while it's also important, uh, starting with Eusebius and Augustine, the millenaristic idea of the kingdom, of an earthly kingdom, is dismissed as a kind of a Jewish legend. Mm -hmm. However, the kingdom of God is strongly present in the Gospels, where it refers not to a future reality, not to future reality, like in Judaism and the early fathers, but to present reality. To those who ask him, when will the kingdom arrive? Jesus answers, that it has already arrived. Like in Luke 11.20, now the kingdom of God has arrived to you. Ara eftasen efimas e basileia tuteu. Already arrived. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the presence of the kingdom is often expressed in the Gospels with verbs in the perfect tense, which denotes, of, uh, evidently, in Greek, events which have already taken have already taken place. Like in Mark one one, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God came closer. But engis and uh, the Greek uh, term from where the verb engizo comes means etymologically at hand. It's there at hand. You can touch it. And uh, at last, two of the blessings in Matthew 5 are in the present tense. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for rightness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Eh? His and not will be. And scholars also agree that in Luke 17.21, Jesus answer to the Pharisians who ask uh, when will the kingdom come uh, he, he, he answer uh, the kingdom and tos imon estin which that doesn't mean uh, like uh, usually we translate it is within you but it means among you it's there among you attend Now, an important point, the first time that Benjamin mentions the concept of kingdom of God is precisely quoting the passage from Luke, this passage from Luke. In a letter to Carla Seligson, who was a, a friend at the time of the Jugendbewegung, September 1916, he writes, Today I felt the extraordinary truth of Christ's words. See, the kingdom of God is not here or there, but within us. So he quotes in the ordinary translation the passage. Uh, in my book on Paul, following Jacob Taube's suggestion, I try to show that Benjamin's conception of messianic time was strongly influenced by Paul's letters. And then the thesis on the concept of history, Benjamin famous text, one of the last texts of Benjamin, contains hidden quotations from Paul. That's an important point now to, uh, it's important to clarify, to make clear this point. 
This does not mean that Mania, Benjamin uh, was not influenced by Jewish tradition. Paul is a Jewish author. Paul is not Christian. Paul does not know the term Christian. He doesn't know the term Christian. And if he had known, Christian for him would mean, as it means, messianic. Christian means messianic. So there is, there is a so the, the translation of our tradition. Uh, we, we forgot what was the situation in Paul's time. To distinguish between Jewish and Christian is ridiculous. It's an anachronism. No? That's why we know that uh, even for a century after Paul, we have only something which now we call Judeo-Christianism. We have messianic Christian are just a messianic community. So then, when I say that uh, Benjamin is influenced by Paul, Le Paul's letter does not, not mean that he's influenced by Christian texts and not, uh, and not uh, Jewish texts. Sholem knew perfectly this because once Sholem <laughs> defines Paul, I quote, the most remarkable example of a Jewish revolutionary mysticism. So he knew, but then uh, uh, he doesn't, uh, Sholem doesn't like to speak about Paul. He, he knows that he's a messianic Jewish author, but he prefers not for obvious reason. And uh, before we go on with our interpretation, I would like to remind you uh, when we have to understand Benjamin's relation to theology, to all these problems, we should never forget what Benjamin once wrote about his using or misusing <coughs> theology. I quote, it's a very important point, my thought, Benjamin writes, is related to theology as the blotter paper, the blotting paper, the blotter to ink. It is saturated with it, but if it depended from the blotter, then nothing of what was written by theologians would remain. So it's saturated, but then it uh, abolishes. And we should never forget that when we try to interpret the theological statements in Benjamin's, eh, we always have to remember this. And by the way, I must say that after so many years of uh, investigation on theology, I can say that this is also true for me. And my relation to theology is exactly the same. So even we have um, to investigate theology, it's necessary, but we are not theologians, eh? we are philosophers. Then again on this point of the relationship between the two orders in the fragment, which is very peculiar because it results only from the stubborn persistence of each order in the directions that defines them. So they are heterogeneous, but there is a relation, and the relation results from precisely from the they are persisting in their direction. Um, the profane order, Benjamin writes, not the fragment there, I'm forgetting, should be erected on the uh, idea of happiness, Glück, while the messianic intensity refers to Unglück and suffering. Their divergence is, as Benjamin strongly suggests, an opposition. It's an opposition, you go. And yet, these oppositions produce something as a relation. I quote now. He has this image of two arrows. If one arrow points to the goal toward which the profane dynamic acts, and another marks the, the direction of a messianic intensity, then, certainly, the, the quest of a free humanity for happiness runs counter to the messianic direction. It's opposite. But just as a force can, through acting, increase another that is acting in the opposite direction, so the order of the profane promotes, through remaining profane, the coming of the messianic kingdom. You see the peculiarity of the relation. So they are opposite, but in persisting in their direction, they promote one another. And 
So you see the paradoxical uh, character of this relation. It is an opposition without any medium, there is no medium, which could appear as the divergency. The two orders persist in their unyielding movement, and yet Benjamin writes that the profane, I quote again, important point, the profane, although not itself a category of the, the kingdom, is a decisive category of its quietest approach. For in happiness, all that is earthly seeks its downfall, and only in happiness it is destined to find it. This image of the two arrows, or the two forces, the while acting in opposite directions, promote or can promote one another, <coughs> perhaps comes from a passage of the capital, Marx, that's capital, 113, uh, where Marx writes, uh, he has this uh, 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 image of an ellipse. It is a contradiction that a body falls continuously in another one and at the same time moves away from it. The ellipse is a form of movement where the contradiction is resolved. In this perspective, we could look to uh, the Benjamin relations of these two orders as if they formed an ellipse whose two fires are the kingdom and the profane. So also in Marx's idea, there is a, a position, an opposite movement that forms uh, uh, something uh, unitarian. Uh, the other image, in Benjamin takes the image of a, uh, a quietest approach, eh? derives probably, can derive probably, from the passage in the New Testament many passages, Matthew, etc., etc., where we read that the Lord's day will come as a thief in the night, when nobody is expecting it. And yet it's not the same, but while in the Gospel, the, in these passages, the believers are invited to remain awake in order not to be surprised by the coming uh, the, of the Messiah as a thief, because on those who believe themselves to be in peace and security, the Lord's day will arrive as ruin. Which I, I am always uh, strongly uh, impressed by, the, by this passage, in which the category that our government today use always, peace and security, peace and security, peace and security, in the, um, in the, in the tradition of um, the Apocalypse and the Gospels, precisely means ruin. When governments speak of peace and security, ruin comes. This is precisely <laughs> our situation. Security reasons means ruin. Okay, that's nonsense. Uh, oh, so, so while in the fragment the idea is that when they say, uh, in Benjamin's fragment, it is uh, different because uh, the persistence of the profane order in two happiness promotes the quietest arrival of the kingdom. Uh, the last part of the fragment tries to define the nature of the profane sphere, and uh, so far as it is erected, as you say, on the idea of a happiness, Luke. Benjamin identifies happiness, that's an important point, with the caducity, vergangness, with the passing away that define every earthly cre creature. And this uh, passing away for, for Benjamin as a kind of a messianic uh, meaning. I quote, For in happiness all that is earthly seeks its downfall, and only in happiness it is destined to find it. To the spiritual restitutio in integrum which introduces immortality, corresponds a worldly restitution that leads to the eternity of a downfall, and the rhythm of this eternal, transient, worldly existence, transient in its totality, in its spatial, spatial, but also in its temporal totality, 
the rhythm of a messianic nature is happiness. For nature is messianic by reason of its eternal and total passing away, vergängnis. To strive after, after such passing, even for those stages of man that are nature, is the task of world politics, whose method must be called nihilism. Would you please speak a bit more in the microphone? <laughs> yeah, no, <please. laughs> okay. I'll try to speak aloud the other. Huh? <laughs> As Taubes suggested, the cue, the starting point eh, may, of this passage may come from uh, the famous passage in Romans 8 on what co Paul calls the Apocaradochia Tesctisios, eh, on nature which having been subdued to corruption, Torah, looks eagerly for messianic redemption. Um, Luther, in his translation that Benjamin was reading, eh, uh, I, I think that uh, I'm quite uh, sure that Benjamin always uh, quotes Luther translation. Eh, and we have the same terminology in Benjamin and Luther's translation. Luther, in the translation so that Benjamin was reading, renders Ftura, corruption, Ftura, with Vergängliches Wesen. Exactly the term Benjamin is uh, using, eh? Vergängnis. But in the very moment when it takes over the Paulinian image, Benjamin reverses its meaning. Caducity and corruption are no more a figure of slavery, of uh, uh, being subdued to mortality. But on the contrary, they coincide with happiness and favor the coming of the Messiah, of the kingdom. <laughs> and on the other hand, a more careful reading shows also that in Paul, a messianic element is also present in nature, like in Benjamin. No? Uh, in its pains are in reality, as Paul writes, birth labors. For nature hopes to be freed from the slavery of corruption. So, so here also in Paul there is a, a, a messianic uh, uh, presence in, the, in nature. Huh? So here we have seen the affinity between the New Testament resource, Testament resource, and Venom fragment. But what lacks um, completely in uh, New Testament resources is precisely the primacy Benjamin assigns to the idea of happiness. This is lacks uh, totally in the New Testament. While in the fragment it has such a pregnant function that Benjamin has to connect it with a fundamental eschatological category, which is the restitutio in integrum. He, has, he employs this Latin expression, restitutio in integrum. That's to say the restoration of everything into its original condition that defines the end of time. Uh, elsewhere, to express the same concept, Benjamin employs the Greek term Apocatastasis, exactly the same term. Eh? And this is an important point because with this term he borrows from Origines and he quotes Origines. According to Origines, all creatures, including Satan and the other fallen angels, at the end of time will be restituted to their original condition in God. And Benjamin quotes this in, you will remember, perhaps in this beautiful essay on Leskov. Leskov. Benjamin, I quote now, he quotes Origenes' thesis, he, says, he writes, that were rejected by the Roman Church on the apocatastasis of all souls in paradise. So he quotes uh, Origenes. And in a fragment of the Passage and Verk, Benjamin quotes again Origines without naming it, writing that, I quote, 
all the past must be eingebracht, recovered in the present, in a sort of historical apocatastasis, employs again the term. So we have restitution integrum, uh, apocatastasis, uh, two terms um, from origins. But as uh, we saw, the quotation doesn't mean um, uh, uh, that uh, the same thing, uh, thought is there because uh, here we have in Benjamin we have a kind of reversed apocatastasis because in the last uh, text I quoted uh, uh, all the past must be recovered in the present in a sort of historical apocatastasis you see he reversed the direction while the restitution interval goes, runs from the present into the past here, all the past must be introduced in the present in a sort of historical apocatastasis. So while in the spiritu spiritual restitution integrum everything is restored to its original condition, here, in this uh, kind of historical apocatastasis, all the past must be restored in the present. This uh, profane apocatastasis that leads everything to its downfall and whose rhythm is happiness is certainly one of the Benjamin's greatest uh, theological invention. Uh, here is a kind of uh, theological uh, invention. So. Uh, once more, the profane historical order and the messianic one are distinguished, and yet as the use of the, term, the theological term apocatastasis shows, they seem to interlace. The, this op new position, the idea of an opposition between the kingdom and the historical order is not Benjamin's uh, discovery. Eh? Uh, already Offerbeck, the prominent theologian that Benjamin begins to read as early as 1918, so very, when he was still very young, he, he reads uh, Overbeck, he quotes Overbeck, and then he reads it again. Overbeck, I don't know if you remember, Overbeck is uh, Nietzsche's uh, friend, is the one who, when uh, Nietzsche uh, becomes uh, crazy, comes to Turin and takes it back. So he's a, a great uh, historian of the origin of Christianism. Right? He has this marvelous idea of uh, Urgeschichte, prehistory. Uh, whenever we make an uh, historical investigation, we have to cope with uh, prehistory, Urgeschichte. Every historical uh, investigation has to confront with pre what he calls prehistory. Um, so it's another problem. So, uh, already Overbeck had stated clearly the incompatibility between Christ and history. It says always that. And the same contrariness is at the center of Karl Barth theology, another author that Benjamin reads uh, early. <laughs> it is plausible that Benjamin knew the article that Henri Corbin between, uh, published in number three of a very beautiful magazine, philosophical magazine called Research Philosophique, directed by Coiré and Puech. Uh, why I say this? Because uh, Benjamin reviewed this uh, Research Philosophique. He made a, a review for the Institute for Social Forschung. And in this text, Corbin quotes Barth, stating, I quote, the judgment of God marks the end of history and not the beginning of another history. So it's very near to what Benjamin says, the end. Again, what we call history of salvation <coughs> is only the crisis, that is to say, the incessant judgment on history, and an not another history. And in the same perspective, another important uh, theologian, Eric Peterson, the one who strongly criticizes Carl Schmitt's idea of uh, politi political theology. Again, again uh, Peter Peterson uh, has the same idea. Uh, he writes, uh, Christ put an end 
to profane history. So this idea of a, not a goal, but an end, which is so strong in Bellamy, could perhaps come also from this. Christ put an end to profane history. After him, history became sinless, meaningless. And we know that in 1933, Benjamin reads the book by the theologian Albert Mirgeler, Geschichte und Dogma, where the author translates the Chalcedonian dogma, and you know, the two natures of Christ, Christ has two natures, not one, divine and human. He, he translates this dogma in the political dualism between uh, Pope and Emperor, or what he calls also spiritual and profane power. And in the same years, the Benedict, uh, Benedictine Abbey of Maria Lark, Catholic theologians began to revalue the concept of Gottes Reich in relation to the Nazi theorization of the Third Reich. This is very important. So this, the 30s uh, are a moment in which we, the concept of um, kingdom of God is uh, evoked by the theologian also in relation to the use that the Nazi were doing of it. So we could perhaps hear in Benham fragment a kind of echo of all this problem. Hmm? And this could suggest a later dating of the fragment, not in the 20, but in the 30. But this is not our problem. We are not here to try to find the date. I would rather focus now on uh, better understanding this antagonism between the kingdom and the historical order. You remember, you have to remember the radicality of Benjamin's thesis, the profane order cannot relate its, uh, itself to anything messianic. The kingdom of God cannot be set as a goal of the political sphere, only as an end term. Why this point is so important to me? Eh? Because, uh, if you read it correctly, this thesis totally contradicts our current representation of political action and obliges us to call in question the way we conceive politics. This is what I've been trying to show. If we have to understand the fragment, we have to completely call in question our model, our paradigm of what a political action is. You will remember that uh, in the 18 thesis on the concept of history, uh, Benjamin says that Marx's classless society is a secularization of the theological concept of kingdom. So again, the concept of kingdom, but Benham says the, the Marx idea of a classless society is just a um, secularization of the idea of a kingdom. This means that just as the messianic kingdom, the classless society and all the <coughs> ideals that have inspired modern politics should never be conceived as a seal, as a goal of a political praxis, or as something that must be made real. I would be obliged to use the term realize, that you know in English required that forget the current idea, I employ realize in the old meaning of making real, achieving. Uh, so the, the kingdom, the classless society, revolution, all our political ideals <coughs> should never, if we keep uh, to, to Benjamin fragment, never become a goal of political action. In the perspective of the fragment, so we can say that the great error and the failure of all modern ideologies consists precisely in flattening the messianic order on the historical one, forgetting in this way that the kingdom should never be conceived as a goal. 
but only as an end termination. It's clearly this uh, complete reversal. We are, we are uh, accustomed to think that this ideal, revolution, classless society, whatever, whatever, are a goal of political praxis, and we must realize in historical context this idea. What Benjamin is saying, this is completely false. Uh, the, these ideas must be there. He's not uh, repudiating these ideas, but he's saying they must be kept heterogeneous to the historical profane order in the sense not that they have nothing to do with it, but that they must never be conceived as a goal, but as an end. If you conceive the kingdom as something that must be realized in the historical order, it will necessarily reproduce in new forms the existing order. That's what we have seen. That's what happened. What happened? If you uh, conceive these uh, ideals, which refer to kind of kingdom or whatever, to, uh, and you try to realize them as a goal, there will be a complete failure. Eh? So in classless society, revolution, whatever, eh? like the kingdom, are for Benjamin messianic concepts, as he say in the 18th century, in eh, the 18th thesis. So in Benjamin's perspective, they cannot be posited as goals without losing their force and nature. And um, th that's true, that's wha exactly what happened. But, this important point, this doesn't mean that messianic categories must remain utterly ineffective in the historical order. Not at all. Eh? Benjamin states clearly that only the messiahs produce and bring to an end the relation between historical events and the kingdom. So there is a relation, but it's not a relation of a mean to a goal. So this means that, uh, according to Benjamin, the relation exists, is there, but in this peculiar form of a convergent divergency. The two heterogeneous elements coexist, but, but they must not be confused or flattened one on the other. That's an important point. Hmm? And, and, and perhaps this is perhaps why um, when Marx, in the introduction to Hegel's, to the critic of Hegel's philosophy of law, evokes precisely the idea of, a, a of realizing philosophy into politics, into politics, but then he adds immediately, you cannot realize philosophy without abolishing it, and you cannot abolish philosophy without realizing it. So, uh, you know that uh, these fragments are always quoted in order to, uh, to uh, say that Marx has precisely an idea of realizing philosophy. But if you pay attention, it's not saying that uh, you must realize philosophy into politics. It says something more complex. It says that if you try to realize philosophy into politics, you have to abolish philosophy. <coughs> <coughs> That's why perhaps uh, Adorno has this idea of, uh, of the, that philosophy lost his chance of realizing itself. But what does he mean to realize? Eh? Perhaps you will have understood that what here I'm doing is strongly criticizing the idea of realization. We have, uh, we conceive politics, uh, even if we don't pay attention to it, but inside uh, our mind we have this idea that politics consists in realizing something. We have to forget this. Only if something remains unachievable, it can act on history. But uh, now if we go back to this uh, Marx point, uh, you cannot uh, realize philosophy without abolishing it, and you cannot abolish philosophy without realizing it. It's curious that um, Guy Debord 
quotes this passage in relation to the problem of art. You perhaps uh, remember the board r um, writes Dadaism tried to abolish art <coughs> without realizing it. Surrealism tried to realize art without abolishing it. Both failed and we situationists want both to abolish and uh, so he quotes ben, uh, Marx um, passage in relation to art. And this is because also in art we, s we can say exactly the same process. Eh? What, what did the avant-garde make trying to realize art into life? And again, the same error. So they flatten uh, in order to one another. So the problem we have to cope at this point is try to define the specific mode of being of each of the two orders. <laughs> and this means that we must be able to think anew the problem, I think, of the relation between possibility and reality. That's a, on a philosophical point of view, the problem is how we conceive the relation between possibility and reality. Possibility, you know, these are Aristotelian categories, uh, dynamis and, and, and energia. Possibility and actualities, dynamis and energia, according to Aristotle, are two ontological categories, two experiences of being, to each of which correspond a specific modality of existence. So we have to uh, forget thinking possibility as something unreal that must be realized and fulfilled into act. Possibility is in itself real. Uh, I think that in Benjamin's perspective, we have to accept this consequence. You know? uh, as Benjamin says that to order, which is the peculiar relation to orders, this means that possibility is already in itself uh, real. You have not to conceive as a goal of a praxis. And uh, this presence acts on reality, uh, interrupting, breaking the historical continuum, according to Benjamin. As philosophy cannot and must not be realized in politics, but is already perfectly real in itself, in the same way, in the fragment, the messianic kingdom acts on the historical order only if it remains unachievable, <coughs> never conceived as a goal. And only in this way it can save its most precious gift, which is precisely possibility, without which no space would be left to an event. And I think this is why Benjamin can write that the method of world politics must be called nihilism. The radical heterogeneity of the messianic doesn't allow to make plans and calculations for its realization in a new historical order. It cannot appear as a goal, but only it, it, it can act if it, it remains unachievable. Eh? I would say now in my terminology, not as a constituent power, this must constitute and realize a new constitution, a new order, but only as a destituent potency that remains unachievable, interrupts uh, the kind of nihilism, eh? interrupts, uh, destitutes every uh, political praxis. Okay, I think we can stop now, but just add that uh, as you have perhaps have understood, so the main idea is uh, um, <coughs> criticize strongly this model of realization. I think that um, the idea we have of reality, when we speak of reality, never forget that reality is just uh, a modern uh, derivation from this concept of res, thing, thing. This concept of res has a strange history. 
Res is the most frequent uh, term word in the what remains of Latin literature. So, according to lexicologists, the term more frequent in the uh, literary tradition is res. But strangely, this term disappeared. So, we the, the, the modern terminology coming from res, reality, to realize, etc., real, etc., are modern terms. They begin only in the 16th century. Uh, we have an apparition in uh, medieval thought as uh, uh, realitas, but very uh, rare and peculiar sense. But on the contrary, in modernity, this term is everywhere. Re to realization, realize, realizzare, realtà is everywhere. And I think that when we uh, speak of reality, we mean realization. If we never, so we, what is around us is something that has been realized. This has been realized. It's not real. So I mean, just to say that uh, the, the I'm now making a kind of uh, archaeological inquiry on this notion of uh, reality, and it appears very. And uh, I'm, this goes with the Benham fragment. In, in my idea, Benham fragment has a strong um, uh, implication that we must never conceive political action as a goal to realize. Thank you.